I'm going to start with where I am in the moment. <laughs> Suddenly amused, um, the screen is cleared and just showing I'm 13 minutes into my video. <laughs> this thing is insane. Hmm. Feeling lower energy today. Today's kind of a dip in energetic cycles. Wanting to move more slowly. Um, less inclined to smile. There is some sadness in my heart. Uh, sort of like my uh, like my blood is more viscous. There's a kind of slowing down throughout the whole system. Um, these states for me often feel like a uh, an invitation for rest and for ease. I'm just watching these these cycles happen. There's um, one thing I've become particularly aware of is how much I smile in order to put on the presentation. There's a um, there's a feeling like I, I don't even quite remember when it was. I think it was a couple of days ago. I noticed a way that I when I when I am angry at objects. I, I, think, I, I remember it was with playing my guitar. Um, and there was um, like trying to learn how to do a, a basic C chord. And uh, it would buzz. No matter what I would do, it would buzz. And this just kind of anger and impatience came out about it. like, fuck it, why? It's, it's just not gonna. But the reaction that I had was to smile and laugh, going, why does it buzz? And I remember the feeling. I remembered how, as a little kid, I was scared of expressing my own anger out of an impression that the adults would become dangerous, which like I was never in any physical danger as a kid, but there was this sense of a threat or a massive disapproval or rejection or something like that that would come if I expressed anger. Now, the, the issue was, I, now I can understand in talking to my parents as an adult and go, well, what's going on with this? And I have a very thorough understanding. Um, I have always had an extremely explosive resource of anger. And um, as a kid, I would go into what might as well have been a separate world and just scream and go berserk. And my family had no idea what to do with it. And as long as I didn't go into that, I was a really sweet kid. But when I tipped over into full-blown possession by anger, that was it. There was no communicating. There was no, it, it wasn't even, I want the ice cream or I want to go outside or whatever. And now I'm going to get really pissed because now even saying, fine, fine, we'll give you the thing, um, wouldn't reach me. And I remember the feeling. The feeling was sort of like, um, oh, now you do. Now that I am expressing this much energy, how dare it take this much? It wasn't that thought through, but that was definitely the feeling. So there's this, um, earlier on I described this as emotional post emotional post-processing, this sense of feelings well up. My mind tracks, oh, these feelings are not appropriate for interfacing with the world. Let me put a mental barrier and digest and figure out which things need to be suppressed and which things can be modified for presentation. Um, meta, and I went into this in a lot of detail, but the really short version is that this is not good in the long run, at least for me because it makes it so that the thing that generates the emotion can't dialogue directly with reality and learn by being in contact with truth. Instead, there's this mental barrier. So I notice the same kind of thing with the humor and the smiling, and 
like it's not always, but the fact that there is something that happens. And there's a kind of honesty that I have a very deep respect for in grief. Years ago, I referred to this as the yin of rationality. I was looking at um, uh, theories of rationality, um, which is like the domain of cognitive science and psychology. Um, and uh, the people I was interacting with predominantly kept pushing a frame that had a whole lot of what I would say is outgoing, more yang energy about uh, um, overcome your biases and uh, shut up and do the impossible. And um, you need to actually do the work, do the math and compute the answer. And yeah, maybe if you, uh, you compute the answer and you can tell something's wrong, so you get an update from your intuitive systems and you use that intuition to inform, ah, so that means there was something wrong in my assumptions and my calculations. So you fold that into your clear thinking. Go forth and conquer the world with a fusion of math and clarity and go for it. And there's a, a lot of noise. It's unsurprising that a tremendous number of people who would use this approach, and the community as a whole had a lot of difficulties with depression and with burnout. <laughs> Amusingly enough, I'm actually talking about this on a platform called The Stoa tomorrow morning. Um, if, if, you, if you are curious, you can go to thestoa.ca um, and uh, you'll, you'll see it pretty high up in the listing. It's uh, unsaving the world. Um, but, um, that's not where I want to center my attention right now. Um, one of the things that I kept noticing was, well, I don't know why this model works, but I'm just going to run with it. This is sort of, um, I don't know, backstreet Taoism. <laughs> uh, just saying, well, yin and yang, like the, the, the outward and the inward, the expansive and the dissolving, these seem to pair and go in symmetry all over the place. I don't know why, but I know that when I see a pattern where there is an obvious symmetry and one side is being biased, then, you can, then I notice it, I can apply this frame and then often see the other side being expressed toxically. So with these people who are expressing what I would say is the yang of rationality, the outward, the forceful, the explosive, the determined, the drive through, use the will, make it happen. When they, they still experience yin, the diminishment, the cooling, the slowing down, the easing, they just experienced it in a much more negative, unpleasant light as depression, as burnout, as exhaustion, as um, limitation and inability to proceed. So I looked at that and I went, well, you know, there's something about, there's a natural sleep-wake cycle, and if you fight sleep, then eventually sleep wins, and the process of sleep winning makes you very dysfunctional when you're awake. Um, and just chugging down more and more coffee doesn't solve the problem. At some point, you need to choose to rest. And if you choose to rest, then your wakefulness is actually much more stable. It's much more um, alert. So honoring the cycle, washing between yin and yang, actually is healthier. And it gives you more yang anyway. So even if all you valued was yang, you would still want to value yin. <laughs> um, I think that's an unhealthy way to view it, but it at least shows that even if you're only obsessed with productivity, the right thing to do is still to rest and to honor rest. Although I think that it's hard to rest properly if you have a goal-oriented way of viewing rest. Today I'm more inclined to view this in terms of Ian McGilchrist's model of the left and right hemispheres of the brain, and what we're actually talking about is the trade-off going back and forth between the left and right hemispheres. Um, but then I would have complexified this picture and it would become a lot more messier, so I'm going to set that aside here. Use an older model a simpler model. So when I talk about the yin of rationality, it is the question of what is true? What is the still, silent truth that I am not admitting to myself? Where is the place that I 
if I were to take a breath and feel. Like I don't want to look there. I don't want to. And there's I've other things. Maybe I could watch a video. Maybe I can. Hmm. hmm I, I've got this math problem I can work on. Well, and I might sound completely nerdy in this respect, but it's a, the, the the rationality community is nerdy, and the and my background is as a mathematician. So, <laughs> but there's. There's still this, um, this this itch. I experience this sort of itch of like, oh, but I don't want to look there. I don't. Want to, can I can I do something else? Can I? Um, that's the ego. Recognizing that if it lays down in the grave, it may die. And this is a dramatic way of describing it. Um, in most cases, it's not that severe. It's more like a diminishment that the ego resists, it doesn't present as death. Um, but my experience is that the deeper you go, the more um, the more clearly related to death it becomes. It's a little aside. And there's, I think lately I've been, um, I, I know why I'm in a diminished state, this is not complicated. Um, all that energy that I felt yesterday in the immense clarity, sort of like a breaking a, uh, a, a breaking an etheric flu. <laughs> my, my, my etheric fever broke and I was, oh, I have so much more stillness capable. I can be here. Oh, that feels really good. My temptation has long been, when that happens, to just enjoy it, to feel the relief, to feel a little bit entitled and to not notice the subtle tug away from noticing the places where there is still pain, there's still energetic muck, there is still stuff, I would say, in the subtle body that could be cleaned out. Normally what happens when I'm not choosing to clean that out from a place of clarity is I feel this period of restfulness and expansiveness and I enjoy it and I deepen it and that's good. And then at some point, something triggers me. And it's more than I'm able to handle from how rooted I am. And I get lost in pain body inflammation, borrowing again from Eckhart Tolle's language. Pain body inflammation, when I, there's, a, there's a terminology confusion here. Um, I think it's, um, I mean, it's not a terminology confusion exactly. It's comparing two different terminology systems. What Eckhart Tolle calls the pain body, I would say is inflammation of the subtle body. And it so happens that there are patterns of inflammation that are self-sustaining, that are sort of like infections. They are a kind of disease that has a certain kind of intelligence, the same way a virus ha has a kind of intelligence. Um, the way that we see the, the coronavirus mutating and becoming, in some cases, it looks like maybe resistant to some aspects of the vaccine. Whether that's true or not, whether we find out that whether it turns out that that's true or not is independent of, of the fact that it could be true, and that kind of effect is a sort of something like an intelligence of the virus, um, not like there is a human-like intelligence behind it, but you know it's it's modelable, as though there is a disease that wants to infect us. And so that's one way to think of it. If you think of it like an entity that is not linguistic, but still a kind of clever, but it's clever in a predictable way, sort of like, um, I don't know, a chess robot, which a chess program is predictable in a particular kind of way, but it can still beat you at chess. This is the same thing. Um, viruses are like this, diseases in general, and the, these patterns can infect the subtle body. We just don't normally think of it this way. Um, we talk about trauma and transgenerational trauma. It's the same thing. It's it's a subtle disease. Uh, usually, a, um, well, it has structure. It has complicated structure. I won't get into the anatomy, the energetic anatomy. But noticing, oh, I am not perfectly healthy at the subtle level. So instead of just deepening my roots and enjoying the reprieve of health, I could instead, I could instead intentionally come from clarity 
to interact with the subtle disease. This has the misfortune of stirring it. It's a little bit like, um, like the way that uh, like herpes is an example of this at the biological level. Um, the way that the herpes virus works is approximately it, it digs into your nerves and then um, it, uh, it embeds in your nerves. I don't know the exact chemical details, exactly what happens at the molecular level, but it somehow embeds. It's, it's, it's in a way that we have no tools yet to be able to properly extract it. This is why herpes is approximately uncurable. It's also not nearly as bad as basically anybody. There, practically everybody has herpes of some version or another. This is not actually a huge issue. Um, but uh, uh, it certainly can invoke uh, purity laws, particularly because one strain of herpes is associated with sexuality and particularly um, North American culture, North American uh, uh, English-speaking culture, as I should say. But especially in the United States, there's a lot of um, purity disdain towards anything sexual. So uh, since herpes, since that sexually transmitted form of herpes is associated with sex, gets associated with purity laws and therefore it gets an extra dose of condemnation. So having that kind of herpes um, is associated with moral impurity as well. Um, that, that tone is not as strong today as it used to be, but I'm pretty sure that's part of the reason why people freak out because frankly the, it's not that bad. I mean I don't, I, I personally don't seem to have any kind of genital herpes as far as I can tell. Um, but uh, and, and, and by all reports, it's just, oh, sometimes this inflames and it hurts and you probably don't want it, but it's not really that big of an issue even if you get it. So why is everybody freaking out? Hmm, that's interesting. So anyway, that's a bit of an aside. Um, <laughs> ah, hmm. Just tracking the way that I'm venting energy into parts of my mind that in ways that don't need to happen that way right now. So I'm just giving myself a moment to reorganize. So in the same kind of way, like, so, well, what I was saying about herpes as the example is that it embeds in nerves and then, um, when it becomes active, I don't quite know what this means, but I, I know what it means symptom symptomatically. Um, like this, this is where the sores come from. The, the it, it becomes virulent. It sort of wakes up and becomes exposed and tears open parts of the flesh and does all kinds of unpleasant things. And then after it gets beaten back, it goes dormant into the nerves again. So. Um, now, I don't know if there's a way to stimulate a herpes virus in particular to become awake, to become active. Um, but this kind of mechanism, this sort of going dormant but being inaccessible, part of the point is that when it's, when it's dormant, um, you can't get at it, which is why we, don't, why we can't cure herpes. It's, it's just embedded in the nerves. And um, it's like, you're not going to tear out the nerves, so what are you going to do? Um, and there's, uh, um, there's something similar that happens with, the, uh, with infections of the subtle body. When we are clear and we're happy and we're expansive, when we're full of light and our uh, subtle immune system is working beautifully, um, there's nothing to solve. It's just good. I think that this is what um, a lot of spiritual traditions are gesturing towards, or part of what, one of the things that they're gesturing towards when, um, when they talk about the natural state of being is blissful. I mean, and th there's a couple of different things. This is a very low manifestation of it. This is like two layers down from absolute unity of non-dual reality. Um, talking about whether non-dual reality is good is confused. <laughs> um, But there is, hmm. 
part of the challenge, just to go meta for a moment, part of the challenge I'm running into is that my, my mind, the way that I usually use my mind in order to track topics and keep them organized and go, ah, this is the arc that I want to go on. Um, if I boot up my mind all the way to be able to track all of that and to stay on topic and to make sure this is how I'm rooting around, it actually starts to get in the way of my vision. So I'm keeping it a little extra deactivated. And uh, so when it gets a little extra energy from one of these offshoots, I meander. Feel a little uh, self-conscious about that, but um, feel. I think m maybe a better way of saying that is the feeling of self-consciousness arises in me sometimes. I'm uh, unimpressed. <laughs> so. Uh, a lot of subtle body infections have the herpes nature so that when we're open and free and clear, we don't notice them, but then somebody says something to us, sort of look at us in a way that reminds us of a way that our first partner would glare at us or something, and then this gets stimulated and suddenly the infection is activated. We, we usually call this being triggered. Um, and now things are not okay and the narrative is going through the head and there are unpleasant emotions uh, and uh, sometimes it doesn't most of the time for most people from what I can tell it doesn't look like a narrative is going through the head and there are unple unpleasant emotions because of an infection it looks like that person is being mean or we are in a threatening situation <laughs> right it's, this, this is the psychological mechanism of projection it's it's not that there's something going on with me, it's that I am in a situation and this is the truth of the world. Well, why? Well, because you, your senses have now been affected by the subtle infection. The interpretative processes have now affected. So, um, the, the thing is that these, these, um, I guess these subtle viri, these energetic viri, um, I, some of which, like in, in the past, I've called some of these demons. Um, I find myself wanting to, I, this is like back in August, I was referring to some of these as demons. And I think it, the term is correct for some of them, but I think it provides weird intuitions. Um, so this kind of, the, the, when these dormant, subtle, energetic infections sprout up, but now they're accessible. But because they've sprouted up, it can distort clarity. So a much more powerful move, one that I, uh, like it just sort of dawned on me fully consciously yesterday. I went, oh, I feel great. And here I am subtly avoiding looking at any of the places that feel bad. And that makes sense because I enjoy feeling good and I don't want to feel bad. And if I look at the places that feel bad, I'm going to feel worse. So I don't want to do that. But here's the thing. When something triggers my subtle energetic infections, when, when the pain body uh, awakens, as Eckhart Tolle would say, I'm much less conscious. And sometimes it can make me almost completely unconscious. And um, this pain body, this this parasite, this energetic parasite, basically controls my mouth and my thoughts and my um, uh, my actions, so that I end up um, doing passive aggressive things with my girlfriend, or so that I slump in a depressed lump off to the side, or I um, I start in a panic trying to make. Uh, some kind of curriculum come together, and this is not what happened with the curriculum I mentioned yesterday, by the way. This, that, that's clear. That's good. Good stuff. Uh, that's still coming along. But um, it has happened in the past where I'll, I'll be forcing a class to come together and making it work out of a kind of fear, because the fear has me. The fear is possessing me. So if I want... To, but but and, <laughs> keep seeing this this biological thing and, and the analogy works perfectly in the subtle realm but the um, but I keep not saying it uh, dormant infections can't be cured 
as far as I can tell. But if you, you awaken them, then the infection is vulnerable. There are ways to describe this in terms of the biology of how neurons work, and not just for uh, herpes, but also for, um, for changing patterns. Like one way of saying this is that when uh, um, uh, what, like what makes a pattern dormant is that like it's, it's inactive. It's like a network in the brain that is inactive. And uh, uh, when it becomes activated, it sort of creates a lived world. So it's necessary to activate the, um, the pattern at the same time that something else is activated as well. That's about, oh, well, this is the world I'm in and I'm safe. Unlike when I was three and that, and, uh, this, that one person grabbed my piggy bank and smashed it on the ground in order to hurt me. And I, like, I have this memory and there's even a little charge in my stomach when I say it. This is one piece for me to consciously digest. But if that memory just flashes through, then I'm suddenly possessed by it. Whereas if I am conscious and I am awake and I am here and I feel good and clear, I am present. And then I go, all right, now from here, I know that there's a feeling right in my belly, right there, where that adult took my piggy bank because they were punishing me for feeling angry and expressing my anger and frustration at it and against my protestations she took my piggy bank and smashed it on the ground that's a little hard for me to talk in the middle of it this is a fairly minor example this is uh, <laughs> this is an example of alchemy inner alchemy in, um, in the sense of, uh, like in the Jungian sense, doing Jungian internal alchemy. I'm able to hold my presence at the same time I'm holding the pain. And by having both of those, I can digest it and integrate it and relate to it differently. And I can reclaim the energies that are laid dormant in my subtle body. So. It's possible, and, and that you can describe that in terms of neurons, but it doesn't matter. Neuronal, neuronal um, uh, networks, I should say. But um, it doesn't matter. The structure of experience makes it very clear. So um, I've been doing that a lot since yesterday. Oh, I have a lot of clarity. Uh, okay. Let me clean, clean myself. Let me actually dig in from a conscious place. Instead of being reactive as these patterns arise. I'm touching on some, uh, some pretty heavy things for me. I haven't gotten all the way to existential yet. And there's a lot of pain. It's part of the sorrow that's happening in my heart. I'm, uh, I'm digging it up. So, um, part of part of the uh, the value of something like when I talk about the yin of rationality, being willing to slow down, to feel the grief. To notice that there is something precious about a belief, a way of living, a lived world that dies away. And in this case, when I'm feeling the grief of that young version of me, I think I was about five when that happened. I felt attachment to like it, it was a Godzilla piggy bank, uh, made of kind of um, ceramic. I still remember how it smelled. <laughs> How's that for strange? I have a fantastic memory for smells. And I remember the feeling of horror and giving up that came over my stomach when I saw it shattering on the, on the pavement outside. 
is grief there. What's needed to interface with that is not logic, it's not recognition of studies, it's not a theory. What's needed is a slowing down, being with the stillness. And that matters. It takes time. It just takes time. It's not a matter of once I figure it out in my head and that feeling is dealt with. That's not that's not where the energy is embedded. It's a little denser than that. It's right here. And dressing that, really slowing down and choosing sorrow, choosing, slowing down, choosing rest, choosing the stillness, it means that the stillness doesn't have to enforce itself. This is another way of saying that death is the final teacher. Um, you could also say something like death is the remedial teacher. <laughs> if you didn't get the lesson up to that point, then death will make sure that you get it or that you aren't there anymore. One of those things will happen. So can I choose to learn the lesson before death has to force it on me? It's this ongoing inquiry for me. Can I choose to learn death's lessons, all of death's lessons? before death forces me to learn them? Can I choose to recognize that there is wisdom there and to take in the wisdom because that's the right thing to do rather than because I have no choice? So in the midst of this, as I reach into this subtle level, and I do this work. Of course, I'm going to feel down. Of course, I'm going to feel drained. I've gotten 10 hours of sleep, 10 good hours of sleep. I decided to take a nap. <laughs> That's because there's actually a lot going on. And there's a funny sense that I could actually just choose to end it at any time. I could choose to turn to the brightness. And I look forward to that. It's deepening the capacity for brightness. It's, it's purifying the range and capacity of the brightness. And, and it's doing so in a way that is um, working to the future. It feels a little funny to work to the future with this stuff because a lot of this has to do with just being capable of being fully present and enjoying this moment. There's a little bit of a paradox there. Can I enjoy this work? Hmm. Not fully. Not fully. Not yet. As long as I uh, pretend that I am experiencing this passage through time, I can see that I will get there eventually. <laughs> Move over Eckhart Tolle with your power of now. Behold the power of later. <laughs> He's talking about this has given me more room for actual humor. I feel more space for it. <clears throat> I feel like that's enough for today. I feel complete. Thank you for listening.